Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number 8 and I'm going to discuss the multipole expansion for the magnetic vector potential. There are seven videos in this section previous to this which are relevant in some form or another and I've written their titles on the bottom left of your screen. However, I'd like to draw your attention to video number 33 in the section of electrostatics where they, I introduced the multipole expansion for the electric scalar potential. Now in video 33 for electrostatics it was the first time I had introduced the multipole expansion and for that reason I tried my best to go into detail and try and motivate the, uh, the use of the multipole expansion. And because of that and because of the effort I did there I strongly suggest that you look at video number 33 on electrostatics prior to looking at this current video number 8 on magnetostatics. So before we begin, let's do a small bit of revision in regard to the electric multipole expansion. So the purpose of studying electrostatics is to calculate the electric field. The electric field of course is a vector. And we use the Helmholtz theorem and the fact that the curl of the electrostatic field is zero to introduce the electric scalar potential V. And the reason we, we use this is because it's a scalar and calculating scalars is much easier than calculating vectors. So we use the scalar potential to calculate the electric field, noting that the relationship is given by the following equation. But the problem with the electric scalar potential is the following. It changes as you add charges to your charge distribution. So we saw when we had a single charge, the form for the electric scalar potential had a factor of 1 over r and for the for two for multi, for excuse me for dipole we had 1 over r squared for a quadrupole we had 1 over r cubed and so on and what this mo motivated us to do was to try and expand out the general arbitrary formula for the electric scalar potential in terms of powers of 1 over r so 1 over r to the n and this of course is a, uh, is going to be a binomial expansion. Specifically, we use the Maclaurin expansion. And we found that each of the terms in our infinite series corresponded to a different, uh, a different charge distribution. So we had n is equal to zero corresponding to a, a monopole, n is equal to one corresponding to a dipole, n is equal to three corresponding to a quadrupole, and so on. But the important point was that the potential you measure at a large distance away from the source is the lowest n value which is non-zero. So if you had a monopole, an electric monopole, let's say we had a positive charge here like this and we wanted to measure the scalar potential at a large distance away from it. What we found was that we would get the monopole term. So let's say it's a 1 over r term. And although we had of course we would have quadrupole excuse me, uh, dipole, quadrupole, octopole terms, the monopole term would very much dominate and we would only, we, that's, what we would, uh, that's what we would evaluate the potential to be. But we found that when we had more than one charge, let's say we had a dipole, which is a plus and a minus charge, the monopole term is zero. And for that reason, we still get terms of the dipole, quadrupole, octopole, and so on. But it turns out that because the dipole term is the lowest non-zero term. It's the, it's the lowest n value with a non-zero uh, with a non-zero magnitude. We in, a, in actual fact measure the the potential to be that of the dipole and that's because the quadrupole and octopole and other terms are negligible by comparison. And that allowed us to introduce something which we called the uh, excuse me the electric dipole moment and the reason we use the dipole moment so I'll give that p P allowed us to analyze what the electric potential was doing in an easier manner and of course V allows us to calculate the electric field in an easier manner. So we're going to do something similar with the magnetic field. We seek an approximate potential of a current distribution at large distances. So in the same manner as with video 33 on electrostatics, we try and expand the magnetic vector potential in a power series in 1 over R. And what we will find is that the series is dominated by the lowest power, which is non-zero, of 1 over r to the n. And notice, of course, that we have to be at a large distance away from our source. 
So in previous videos, we defined what the magnetic vector potential was in terms of the following integral on the top right of your screen. And I've drawn, just for clarity, the, uh, the vectors r prime, r, and the separation vector. So what do we do from here? Well, we're going to do the exact same thing as we did in video 33 on electrostatics. So if you're comfortable with that, you just move on. What we did, first of all, was we noted what the separation vector is in terms of r and r prime. Thereafter, we're going to apply the law of cosines, which I described in video 4 on my tutorial series on vector calculus for electromagnetism. So that is written here. Now, we require, we require basically to simplify this. And a normal and quick technique is the use of a Taylor expansion. So you'll see why in a moment. But what we do is you pull out the r squared term here. And we let everything inside the square brackets to be called epsilon. You can call it whatever you like. What that means in the end is that we're going to have the magnitude of the separation vector is nothing else but r outside of the square root of 1 plus epsilon. And this this suggests the use of a Taylor or Maclaurin expansion, or a Taylor expansion or a Maclaurin expansion, where we center it at 0. So how we do this is we, first of all, invert the, uh, the equation. So we now have 1 over the magnitude of the separation vector here. And we apply the Maclaurin expansion, as discussed in video 14 in my tutorial series on thermodynamics. So when we apply the Maclaurin expansion on the square root, we're going to get the following series. Note it's a, po it's a power series in epsilon. So we get epsilon, epsilon, epsilon to the naught, to the 1, squared, cubed, and so on. Now, although I haven't done anything myself in, my vid in videos uh, on the Legendre polynomials, these, in fact, are the Legendre polynomials. When we plug back in for epsilon, so when we plug back in r prime, uh, r and the uh, theta term. Theta, of course, notice, is the angle between r and r prime. So just accept that the Legendre polynomials are solutions to an equation which we call the Legendre equation, and they just happen to be seen all over physics. You could have, you know, it just happens that these, this particular equation here turns out to be the, Le the Legendre polynomials as well. So we know that the with that 1 over the magnitude of the separation vector can be rewritten in terms of the Legendre polynomials. So going back to our functional form of the magnetic vector potential on the top right of your screen. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do now? Well, first of all, I'm going to rewrite it in another in another uh, form. In this particular equation here, we're using the volume current density, but I'm going to go revert to this form of the magnetic vector potential where we use the current itself and we use the infinitesimal uh, line segment here. Now, let's just analyze what happens if we take a closed line integral. So the magnetic vector potential is for an open integral, but what if we take a closed integral? Let's see what happens. So we're going to take the closed integral of dl prime. Now, Immediately, we're going to sub in for the inverse of the magnitude of the separation vector as seen in the bottom left of your screen. And note, by the way, p sub n is the, or excuse me, r the uh, Legendre polynomials. And of course, it's an infinite power series. So we can rewrite the magnetic vector potential for a closed current loop is the following equation. And note, of course, that I've plugged in the uh, I've plugged in one over the magnitude of the separation vector, and I've kept it in purple just for ease. Now, the next thing to do should be quite natural, in that we start to expand out the power series and analyze each of the terms, and I do this as follows. So we're going to look at n is equal to zero. So this would be n is equal to zero here. Excuse me, for some reason my cursor isn't writing. N is equal to zero. If n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, and so on. So I've written the terms out as clearly as I possibly can. And what we call the terms are as follows. For n is equal to 0, we call that the monopole term. For n is equal to 1, we call that corresponding integral the dipole term. n is equal to 2, we call that particular integral the uh, quadrupole term. For n is equal to 3, we call it the octopole term and so on, off to infinity. Now, notice 
that the monopole term is going to be zero. And this is because it's the integral of the total vector displacement around the loop. Well, that's going to be zero. The first non-zero term will be corresponding to n is equal to one, which we call the dipole term. Now, like I said at the beginning of the video, the dipole term is going to be the lowest non-zero term in the infinite power series. And as a result, although there are lots of other non-zero terms in the power series, usually it is the case that the dipole term dominates and at large distances, it is the corresponding magnetic vector potential and magnetic field, which we in fact uh, calculate or we measure. Now, of course, there are situations perhaps where the dipole term is itself zero and thereafter it would be the quadrupole term which dominates. And if you could come up with a situation where both the dipole and quadrupole terms are zero, then it would be the octopole term which would next dominate. So on the top right of your screen, I've written the magnetic vector potential uh, in the integral form. So putting it all together, we can notice, and we, it's a trick we've done in the past, that if you look carefully, all prime time is the cosine of theta prime. It is in actual fact a dot product between the R unit vector and R prime. And that's something I'm sure you've seen in the past. And just to convince you of that, I've drawn the following diagram and a small bit of mathematics using the uh, scalar product. So that's it. We now have the functional form of the magnetic vector potential, and we've done so using an infinite power series in uh, one over the magnitude of the separation vector. Great. So like I said, the gist is the monopole term is going to be uh, zero, and the dipole term is usually going to dominate, and thereafter, or there, there, therefore you will measure that as the corresponding magnetic field at large distances. But just like when I discussed the electric scalar potential, I introduced a dipole moment, and we found that the dipole moment is very important. In general, the reason the dipole moment is so important is because the dipole moment was a vector that had a very reasonably simple functional form, and we could quite simply analyze the behavior of the dipole, and that told us, without having to do all the very complicated integrals, the behavior of the potential and the field. So the exact same thing is going to happen for the magnetic field. We'll be able to analyze the behavior of the dipole moment. It'll indicate what will happen both to the potential and to the field itself. And it, it, it saves us having to do a lot of mathematics and, and so on. So I introduced next the dipole moment for the magnetic field. Note, by the way, there is a genuine health warning with this, just like when I calculated or when I derived the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. But let's go ahead. So I present to you an important aside, and this is, this is the health warning, really. So the aside is these two pages and the page here on the left-hand side. So we have three pages of, of an aside before we were able to introduce the, uh, the magnetic dipole moment. So let's introduce something called the vector area. The vector area of a plane is, uh, a, a plane is the area of magnitude s whose direction is perpendicular to the plane. And we define a positive direction as one corresponding to an anti-clockwise right-hand rule. So basically, we calculate the area of our shape and we give it, a, we give it the direction, the, the vector direction, perpendicular to the, uh, to the area itself. And it's positive whereby we point the fingers of our right hand in an anti-clockwise direction around the area itself and our thumb uh, extended perpendicular to our hand points in the positive direction. This means that S, we, we usually give S the placeholder for the vector, uh, the vector area, is going to be the scalar area S multiplied by n hat. Of course, if we add to add lots of different uh, small planes, we can generalize to an integral, and that's what I've done right here. And that should be you know, that should be pretty intuitive to you at this stage. Notice, of course, that n hat is a local unit vector perpendicular to the plane S. Now why is the vector area, why is it different to the scalar area? Why do we care about it? Well, let me introduce, let me introduce it and just uh, make one or two comments. So first of all, it is often the case that the vector area is less than the scalar area. And you might say that makes no sense. Well, first of all, let's look at this diagram on the left-hand side. 
This is just going to il illustrate the, the vector area. So we have, in this case, a, it's, it's, supposed to be, it's supposed to be a circular area. And note I've defined the positive direction by moving the fingers of my right hand in anti-clockwise direction and having my thumb, when it's going to be perpendicular to my hand, is going to be pointing in the positive direction. In this case, to the right is going to be positive and to the left is going to be negative. So we know that the area of the shape is S and that the vector area it is going to be the magnitude of S but pointing, in this case, to the right. So it seems here that the vector area also has the magnitude of the scalar area. But look at this particular case here where we pick a square. And the square is oriented such that the, uh, the normal component is pointing upwards. If I was then to try and measure the area from a... So viewing the, the area, let's say to the right, we have our detector over here. We won't in fact detect an area of S or an integral, an integrated area of uh, integrating DS. We in actual fact measure zero area. So in this case, the vector area is uh, at this direction, zero. So what we say is the components of the vector area in any direction are equal to the scalar area viewed from that direction. So hopefully that makes sense to you, and it's, it is actually reasonably intuitive. So moving on to a, a small bit of uh, vector calculus. So let's, for argument's sake, define the vector field capital T. And I'm going to say the vector field is the product of two other vector fields, specifically the uh, a constant vector called C and the radial vector R. So there it's the dot product of the two of those. Now let's calculate the gradient of the vector field T. So if you calculate the gradient, it's simply going to be the gradient of the dot product of the constant vector C and the radial vector R. Now, I'm going to employ one of the product rules, and to be honest, I can't remember which one I called it, but if you want, you can look at my videos in Vector Calculus for electromagnetism, where I have derived all of the product rules. So applying the product rule here, we're going to get C outside of, the, or C cross-producted with the curl of the radial vector, plus the, uh, the dot product, or the scalar product between C and the nabla operator, multiplied by the radial vector. Now we know, of course, that the radial vector has no curl. So as a result, this, this uh, contribution is zero, and we find that the, the gradient of the vector t is none other, none other than the dot product between c and the nabla operator multiplied by the radial vector. Now, you can just trust me on this one, but if you actually do the dot product and multiply by the radial vector, you'll get back the vector field c. And that's a bit odd, uh, but it's only a small, it only take maybe two or three lines. So I'm sure you can accept that. Just do the dot product, multiply by the radial vector, and you'll get back C. So let's just note that particular result for the moment and go back to Stokes' theorem. So Stokes' theorem relates a surface integral to a, a closed line or path integral. So let's say we have the vector field F. So we take the curl of F, integrate it over the surface, and it's equal to the line integral of F dot dl. Now let's let f equal to the a constant vector c multiplied by t, t being a scalar, and if that's a bit of a typo here. So I'm going to take the curl of this particular vector field. So we're going to take the curl of the, the product of this, the constant vector field c and the scalar field t. So once again, we're going to employ one of the product rules uh, I can't remember which one it is. You can check my videos on vector calculus for electromagnetism for the proof. And it's quite simple. You're going to get T outside of the curl of C minus C and the, with the cross product of C and the gradient of T. So where do we go from here? Well, notice that we're, in, we're taking the curl of the constant scalar field C. Now, a constant scalar field cannot, or excuse me, a constant vector field cannot have a curl. That means this, this uh, here contributes nothing. So we're left with the, the curl of the field C multiplied by T is in actual fact minus the vector field C and we have the cross product of C and the, the gradient of T. So the next thing we note is the following. 
we plug this particular vector field right back into Stokes theorem up here. And if we do that, we're going to get minus the surface integral of the cross product of C and the gradient of T. And we're going to get the closed path or line integral of T times the vector field C dotted with DL. Now, when you began studying vectors, one of the first, if not the first, identity you would have proven is the following one here. And it's basically where we have the vector field uh, a dot product with with the cur or the cross product of b and c and it's the that's equal to b dotted with c cross a and c dotted with a cross b so it's just a case of moving them something similar to the levi civita using this identity we are able to rewrite the cross product of the constant vector field c with the gradient of the scalar field t dotted with da of course that's the third term so if you want you can say you can say we've we have A, we have B, and we have C, if you want to think about it that way. And if you look closely, we'll see in actual fact we have the constant vector field C dotted with the gradient of T cross-products with the infinitesimal area element. So putting that back into our equation, we have minus the integral, the integral of the uh, dot product between the constant vector field C and the gradient of T cross-products with the infinitesimal area element is equal to the closed line integral of c dot dl. We cancel c and we're left with the following equation here. But at the very beginning, the very first manipulation, we saw that we let t is equal to c times or c dotted with r. So putting that in, we get that the the area or we take the integral, excuse me, of the gradient of t crossed with the infinitesimal area element is minus the closed line integral of the scalar product of c and r dot dl. But or dl is nothing else other than da. So we uh, re rewrite the equation down here and we note that we have da. But the important point is this minus sign that we have here. And the final thing is that we have the integral of the gradient of t cross product with the infinitesimal area element is minus c cross a or is equal to plus a cross c. So this is the end of our important decide. It's time to move back and finally finish off the uh, magnetic dipole. So when we were discussing the magnetic vector potential, we had this particular integral as part of it. So the closed line integral of r hat dot r prime. So if you look closely at these two particular equations here, you'll see that we're able to rewrite this in integral as minus r hat crossed with the integral of dA prime. So that means we can rewrite the dipole moment in this particular term here, or in this particular form here. Well, sorry, excuse me, I'll take that back. This is the dipole moment, and using that equation, we're able to rewrite it as this particular term. So notice that we have, we still have the, the minus sign here. So in order to uh, simplify this, we define the product of the current and the area integral as the magnetic dipole moment m. And because we swap the order, we get rid of the minus sign. We have the dipole moment, the magnetic dipole moment is mu zero over four pi m cross r hat over r squared. Not a trivial derivation, but it is the derivation of the magnetic dipole moment. So if you understand the electric dipole moment, you should have intuitive understanding as, as to why the magnetic dipole moment is so important. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.